Good evening. My name is Michael Kennedy, and it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this evening's event, the culmination of a pretty serious and extensive conversation on the European Union in a moment of crisis. The Watson Institute for International Studies is extremely fortunate to be able to host very distinguished visitors. But I think even more significant than that, it's able to organize conversations, discussions that wind up having lasting impact. I can think of few discussions in which I have participated or even that I have seen that are more consequential than those that have been happening over the last couple of days. Tonight, we're pulling it all together. And it's not just a conversation. It's not just a discussion. As my colleague Mark Blythe has suggested, it might be even a little bit of a debate. <laughs> Around this question, is the European Union's future past? We put it a little more nicely on the poster. What is the European Union's future? But I think tonight we are going to actually see something of why the European, future, the European Union has such a promising future. Because of the three people we have before you. Mark Blythe is my most enduring colleague here at the Watson Institute, professor of political science, already known for his existing book, which you should all pick up, entitled Great Transformation, Economic Ideas and Institutional Change in the 20th Century. But you should also anticipate his next book, on which he's working right now, entitled The End of the, in parentheses, Liberal World, Asking if Liberalism, the Cognitive norm and Normative Underpinning of Western Capitalism, can survive into the 21st century. So Mark, you'll be able to see probably more regularly. But our other guests are people who have already been here in the past, and I look forward to hosting them again in the future. Romano Prodi, everyone knows already, the former president of the European Commission, the former prime minister of Italy, and one of the things I like to say about him most, I think, is that he's also a Brown professor at large here at the Watson Institute. Alfred Gusenbauer, the former chancellor of Austria, leader of so many projects within the socialist international, so many distinctions to his name, but again, one of the nicest things to say for us about him is that he is also our colleague and a visiting professor of international studies here at the Watson Institute. When I think about the trio we have in front of you, I can only anticipate an extraordinary discussion, especially when I look around the room and see who else is here. So, without much further ado, let me just put forward what will happen this evening. Our colleague Mark Blythe will spark it and put forward a series of propositions about the future of the European Union, which will no doubt inspire Professor Prodi and Professor Gutenbauer to some amazing retorts. And then we will turn it on and turn it over to you to continue the discussion. So, without any further ado, please help me welcome Mark Blythe. Thank you very much. I can't do serious topics too well, so I'll begin with a joke. What do you call a Scotsman in a suit? The accused. <laughs> what do you call a Scotsman in a suit the second time you see him? The deceased. <laughs> I hope I survive the next ten minutes with my colleagues. <laughs> so I thought this up. The future of Europe is its past. The future of the EU is its past. What do I mean by this? I think there's a trivially true sense that this is true that what the EU has done in its past defines what it can do and therefore what it will do in the future. You're all prisoners of your past, of your past choices, your past successes, your past failures. That's obvious, that's trivially true. But I think that there's another sense that this is not trivially true. That the European Union, and before that the European Community and the European Economic Community and all of the various institutional forms that it has taken over the past 50 plus years 
is a specific type of institution. And that specific type of institution has accomplished almost everything it set out to do. It has, in a sense, exhausted its institutional possibilities. As such, its future will be the management of its past accomplishments rather than expansion into new areas of politics and policy. And I don't think that that's a good thing. But I worry. So what were those achievements? Well, between 1914 and 1945, Europe suffered at least 50 million dead through warfare. If you ever study international relations, you will discover that most of the theories of international relations are drawn from a reading of 19th century European history, notions of the balance of power, in which warfare is seen as the natural condition of man and the natural condition of states. It's not much of a legacy, is it? when you define the 19th century as nothing but bloodshed temporarily halted by massive armaments which collapse in on itself in World War I, produce fascism and Stalinism, and then end with the tragedy of World War II. So European Union is something more than just a supranational institution. It was the last chance for European civilization. It did so in stages in the 1950s with the steel and coal community, specifically designed to stop the Germans and the French trying to beat each other up over supplies of coal and pig iron. It did so in the 1960s, with the European Economic Community and the move towards ever closer union within these institutions, giving content to post-national European space and the notion of Europe <coughs> as something different from a zone of perpetual competition and warfare. This is the place where the Germans have their miracle their economic miracle. This is where the French treble national income between 1945 and 1975. And even the Italians underwent the wonderfully called Il Boom. <laughs> the single market and European projects in the 80s and 90s deepened these processes further. But where they really paid off was in the place we didn't expect, in foreign policy. Because this is the area in which Europe's not meant to be very good. They don't have out-of-area capabilities, they don't have an army, so on and so forth. But that's where the real achievement was, because foreign policy for Europe is foreign policy inside of Europe, with all of those different sovereignties, principalities, preferences, potentates, and everything else. And the first one that Europe successfully dealt with was Spain. Spain could have gone horribly wrong once Franco went, but it didn't. And the reason it didn't was because it was a series of supranational institutions that could rise above national interests and project a, a, a pretense, at least, of neutrality, even if democracy was the preferred outcome. We think of the Balkans in the 1990s as a tragedy, the failure of the European Union. And in many ways it was, let's not sugarcoat it. But in another way it was a tremendous success, because what the EU managed to do, in, despite that failure, was to take in almost every other part of Eastern Europe and incorporate it into a democratic body without a shot being fired. If you'd said to someone at the end of the Cold War, what's the chances of that happening? You would have got extremely long odds. This will continue. The Western Balkans will be integrated. Turkey? Maybe I, maybe no, as they say in Scotland. But nonetheless, it's a continuation of those same processes and projects. So this is a tremendous political success. The Euro has been a pretty good economic success, almost despite itself particularly its very strange origins. But what it will do is it will do what it does best, maintain a European political order, because sadly it doesn't have the capacity for much else. And with 27 members in 22 languages, you have a very, very crowded bargaining table already. And this is why this is a tragedy, despite all this, and why I think that the future of Europe is its past and the management of its past. Because environmental crises are global, they have nothing to do with state capacity, and yet we retreat back into the state to try and find solutions for them. Security threats are not met by national armies. We have had a whole decade of the most powerful country in the world proving that over and over again. Expansion, while great policy, does not cure all problems. And but perhaps what's most dangerous is that mass publics in Europe no longer trust the project itself. They're seen as remote, elites, different from us, who don't care about our concerns, but are very local, very particular, and very against a cosmopolitan ideal that demonizes the other, the immigrant, that which is different, in, income, in countries whose income polarization has gotten worse and worse over the past decades. So just as we need it, we need it to be more. Its very success means it's tied down. It cannot be more than what it already is. The EU is a tremendous success, but it 
can't be any more successful than it is. And that is my fear. And the last consequence, 
is that many achievements must be done by in states that say in the first stage 10, 11, uh, uh, 15 counties agree and then the others uh, follow. Mm, this is not new. The euro was signed by 11 counties. Now there are 16 and I do think that very soon a couple of other countries will join the euro. So this is the condition of these limited agreements is that the door must be open. Let's say if you make agreement between France, Germany, so on, that are exclusive, this is anti-European. This, if you make an agreement and anybody can enter uh, at the same condition, this is open and very sufficient. These are the uh, problems that you have to tackle in order to be a strong union, a, a strong union in the future. You can, if you don't do that, clearly uh, you are always open to the, you know, absolutely eternal complaint that I received in any country I go, let's say in the Mediterranean area, in the Middle East, you know, uh, that is very simple. You are the biggest trader, uh, you are, you know, uh, you have, uh, you know the situation, our situation, you know our policy, you know that, and you don't do anything. Why? Why you are so inactive? Why? And the explanation is that uh, you can't do anything if you don't uh, uh, progress in the condition that I listed. This is the reason why I think that these are the preconditions for a strong Europe in the future. Can you do it now? No. In this moment, you can't. I have to be honest with you. You can't because the maximum we could get is a Lisbon Treaty in which you have some progress, as we have said this morning, but in which you don't fulfill this condition except in very marginal aspects of, of this, even if from in other chapters we, are do, we have done with this some substantial progress. To you. Well, difficult for me to disagree. Um, because uh, the problem of our debate today is um, that Romano and me, we are sharing so many views about uh, the European Union, and maybe we belong to those who are very much favoring a more integrated Europe. So I remember when we were sitting in Brussels, European Council, uh, during uh, the night of the long nights, uh, when uh, you have to come to an agreement, you know, and when uh, the council will not be concluded without an agreement, uh, we had Angela Merkel as uh, president of the European Union then, and of course, as usual, we had a lot of problems with the British uh, <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the twins and the twins. We mean the twins from Poland. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, there was already a proposal, but during the debate and the bilateral negotiations, I mean, the British and the twins always tried to get out uh, more meat out of the already existing proposal for the Lisbon Treaty. So, and uh, Sarkozy was acting. Uh, to a certain extent as an interlocutor with, uh, with our friends from Poland and the proposal from hour to hour was watered down and then Romano was already very desperate together with uh, uh, some other colleagues and we were meeting I think 3 o'clock in the night in an extra room sitting there and saying listen I think it's better we are going home now because uh, uh, at the end of the night we are ending up with a treaty which doesn't really make uh, a difference with what we had already. So it's better we stop now and we say we go to sleep and we go home and maybe we meet in some days. And then we took the decision to stay. Why did we take the decision to stay? Because one has to understand 
under which circumstances we are coming to results and conclusions. And the problem was that the now still existing Nice Treaty led to a lot of frustration among decision makers, policy makers all around Europe. And everybody said the Nice Treaty is the last treaty of that kind. Now we need something fundamentally new. We need a European constitution. And there was a lot of enthusiasm to write the, all the treaties that were already existing, putting it into a constitution and rewriting the whole thing from scratch. Enormous impetus, enormous energy. There was a very good uh, project of uh, the European uh, Commission then, uh, which made uh, a lot of uh, proposals. How was the... Penelope. Penelope. How could it I forget Penelope? Because yes, yes, okay. they make the uh, texture during the day and okay. so, so the beauty during the, the night. <laughs> the, beauty, the, beauty of the, the beauty of the text was comparable with the beauty of Penelope Cruz. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it was an excellent, it was an excellent text. And uh, we had the European Congress. I mean, all the enlightened people coming together, drafting a proposal. And then there was the Intergovernmental Conference, which already brought forward a different proposal. And then it was not talked about anymore about the Constitution, but a constitutional treaty, which is already something else. And uh, why did that happen? While we were discussing on the European level in those days, uh, the mood and the political tendencies on the national level were already changing. National governments wanted to have more competences, more power, and this uh, short window of opportunity after the frustration of the Nice Treaty was already closed. And so, since the proposal of the Constitutional Treaty, we were in an uphill battle to preserve at least something of the pro-European energy that was expressed by the wish for a European institution. Unfortunately, the Constitutional Treaty failed in uh, two referendums in the Netherlands uh, and in France. And then, of course, you had all these debates again, how do we deal with the situation, etc., etc. To make the long story short, the result of this process was the Treaty of Lisbon, which, from the point of view of a person or a country that is very much in favor of integration, and for somebody who would have been in favor of a European uh, constitution, it's a little bit disappointing. But if you compare it with Nice, and if you compare it with the also today present let's say, priorities on the national level, it's much better than what you could get today. But the problem is, we're still lacking the <coughs> signature of uh, President Klaus, and we hope that the Lisbon Treaty will be uh, implemented by the end of the year. But this means that almost a decade, almost a decade, then was spent on a new treaty. On finding unanimity. On finding unanimity. And this is, of course, an enormously uh, long time. And in addition, it sends a signal to the citizens <coughs> like, we are not dealing with your problems now. Unemployment, migration, economic crisis, yes, uh, this is not our problem. Our problem is the treaty. So it sends the signal that we are not dealing with the, pe with the people and their concerns but that let's say, the European elite is dealing with, with itself. And therefore, this long, long period was taking away a lot of energy from the European project. And at least my impression is, the next step 
further integration of Europe requires political energy. And at the moment, I don't think that this energy is coming from inside. It might come from the outside by a major crisis that is reshaping the European circumstances in a way that the new debate is going to start. But at the moment, everybody is happy if this Lisbon thing is finished at the end of the day. So if we are coming into a situation where enough political energy is there to think about further integration, I think that uh, all the points that uh, Romano mentioned are of enormous importance. I think one among them is the most important one. The most important one is the budget and how the European Union is generating its revenue. Because up to now, <laughs> according to the wealth of a country, you are paying your contributions to the European Union. And then according to the necessities and to the stage of development, etc., etc., you are receiving European funds. Which leads to a very strange situation, which always becomes very important when the next budget is discussed, that you have two groups, the net payers and the net receivers. And by definition, the net payers are, of course, very much interested in limiting the European budget, because they think if we are going to increase the European budget, it means that we, as the net payers, are paying more, which, in my understanding, is a completely anti-European understanding. I want and my money back. I want my money back, of course. Uh, Margaret Thatcher <laughs> became famous with that. <laughs> this is very anti-European, and of course it normally does not uh, happen uh, on the national level. So, For instance, if you ask me, and I have been the Prime Minister of Austria, which provinces of Austria are net receivers or net contributors to the Austrian budget, I could not tell you. I mean, I have a guess, uh, roughly, but, I mean, precisely, I could not tell you. So, what would be a very important step forward is that we are not talking about anymore about net payers and net receivers, because there should not be any more payments by national government. I favor direct European taxes that are generated I don't know, upon uh, gasoline or uh, upon uh, VAT, uh, VAT, part, of VAT. part of VAT or uh, let's say um, financial transaction taxes or whatsoever. I mean now the customs, <coughs> the customs go to the European Union. Yes, so but, uh, but uh, it's very small, very yeah. small. You cannot survive with that even no. if you are very And modest. when you liberalize the are getting smaller. Decrease. 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 So, what I mean is direct revenues for the European <coughs> Union that are not going via the distributional channels of the national governments, and then you spend the money for what you think is necessary and useful, no? helping those that have to economically develop finance uh, the programs that you need in order to fight the, the climate change. I mean, all the programs that you agree on. But the most important thing is to come to a direct financing of the European Union and to abolish the system of intergovernmental financing that splits the Union into two groups, the net receivers and the net payers. And of course, in total, it has to be more than 1%. Because, uh, I mean, with all the expectations that are connected 
with the European project, even if some parts of our electorate uh, are going through some frustrations, if you say, nobody would think, nobody would think that only 1%, only 1% of the European GDP is going into the European Union. Normally, the public thinks much, much more money. When I asked it to my students, okay. nobody told less than 10%. Yeah. Right. And no. if we would start with 10%, it would be definitely too much. No, 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 but I said to give yeah, of the idea, <laughs> you know, because everybody says drastic bureaucracy, yeah. you know, overpowerful Europe yeah. and so on and so forth. Mm. People think that it's 10%. Yeah. Right. So this is. I think the most important point. The second thing, um, the exit plan. <coughs> theoretically, theoretically, it should be there. But um, I think it's very difficult to perceive that this exit clause is used especially when we are talking about an even more integrated Europe. It's, of course, much more difficult to get out of that. And, of course, one could say what you have achieved so far you can be in. But you're part of the Euro. And let's hope that in future we are getting something like a European economic government which is the opposite of the European Central Bank, being equipped with the tools of economic policy that normally a government has available. I think it's very difficult to perceive that the country is part of the Euro, so part of the rule of the European Central Bank, etc., etc., but then not part uh, of the first decision-making process and then uh, not responsible for the implementation of the decisions concerning, for instance, European economic policy. So there are areas where practically an exit, where practically an exit would be very, very difficult, but theoretically I'm in favor that it is there. Because the interesting question in front of the national electorate normally is when you are discussing European Union issues and then people say they like this and they dis dislike something else and, and do you find that the European Union is a sympathetic institution etc etc you always have this Eurobarometer that is measuring the approval of the European Union I think by the way that this Eurobarometer is a complete stupidity. It's a complete stupidity. Because in Austria, people are also not asked, do you like Austria? <laughs> and in Italy, they are not asked, do you like Italy? No. Look, they are asked, do you like the Prime Minister? And are you in favor of the tax increase? Or of the tax reduction? Whatsoever. Yeah? But on the European level, you still ask the approval rate. And I think the most important question, apart from the political questions you could put, is the one that is lying behind the proposal of Romano of the exit clause. To ask people, are you in favor that your country uh, continues to be a member of the European Union, or are you so much fed up that you think uh, we should be outside the European Union? And the interesting thing is, that if you are going to ask that question, it's quite normal. I mean, I can tell you from the Austrian case, and we are belonging to the more skeptical one, not me, but my people, and uh, I tell you, in 1994, in the referendum, 66% of the population voted in favor of the Austrian entry into the European Union. So we have two-thirds in favor, one-third against. If you ask people now, <coughs> are you in favor or are you against of Austria's membership in the European Union? It's more or less the same. Some months the approval rate 
is 68 percent or 70, sometimes it's 64 percent. But the, let's say, two-thirds to one-third pro-European and uh, those that are against hasn't changed fundamentally. And in most of the other countries, it's by the way the same. I mean, there are countries, of course, with a higher approval rate. But the fundamental question, do you want to continue or not, in all the member states of the European Union, by all the populations, is decided very clearly to be in favor of a continued membership. And this, I think, is the idea behind the exit clause, no? To say, okay, we can discuss, and we, we take the arguments, and we try to find compromises, but at the end of the day, we <coughs> have to come to a decision. And no country should have the possibility to block progress in Europe. And if you think that this is that catastrophical, what all the others want, then of course there's the possibility that you find an exit. But among us, we think only theoretically in this perspective and not practically. One point that uh, I think was very important in our debates uh, the last days was the issue of politicizing Europe. And I think that for the future of Europe is of enormous importance. What do we mean by that? <coughs> the main difference between democracy and dictatorship is that in democracy you can get rid of your ruler because via elections you can vote a government out of office which is one of the main fundamentals of democracy in dictatorship you do not have this possibility now the problem in Europe is that we do not have this type of democracy so far because you are going to the European elections, but whatever the result of the European elections is, you are not voting out the government because there is no government. Huh? You only have the, the commission, which could be seen as the executive of the European Union. But so far, the outcome of the European elections had no consequence for the European Commission. Now, with the Lisbon Treaty, we are entering gradually a new stage, because we said the party that is the strongest party, as a result of the European elections, has the right to nominate the President of the Commission. But frankly speaking, this is important. It's important. But we have a Commission of 27, and most of the times, those that are sent to the European <coughs> Commission represent the balance of power within the national governments and do not represent, let's say, the balance of power on the European level. And therefore, I mean, it could be that one party is winning the European <coughs> elections, but the other party family has the majority in the governments of the European member state. So it would be very difficult then to find a, a commission that is very cohesive if the president uh, is representing one political tendency and the majority of the commission another. So this explains that the step that we took in the Lisbon Treaty to have a connection between the vote in European elections and the personality or the person of the future president of the European Commission is the first important step, but does not lead us to the same democratic rules that we are accustomed to on the national level. And I think this would be very important, because it would be important to have a competition during uh, elections where we are competing for ideas for the future of Europe. And what are the priorities? And what do we want to have? And which understanding of Europe should be 
in the forefront as long as we do not have that competition. We are opening up a vacuum where all those that are anti-Europeans can come in and use each European elections for posing the fundamental issue. Should we be in favor or against Europe? And to escape from this trap, I think the politicization uh, of the European Union on of the European political process would be of utmost importance because only then we will be able to discuss uh, some of the elements of a further integration that at least I think in our understanding is a major precondition for a good future for Europe. So that means <coughs> that we have already illustrated President Prodi's great problem. We need to end unanimity and there appears to be fairly substantial unanimity on the table here. So perhaps we should open it up to your questions and comments and even an invitation to think about what are the right crises that might politicize <laughs> in the right way for, for the future of Europe? Well, why don't we turn it here? Uh, what do you think the chances are of Ukraine getting into the European Union, taking into consideration its proximity with, with Russia and its war economy? In the present situation, uh, the maximum enlargement that you can have is to the former Yugoslavian countries. But uh, even in this case, we had a break you know, in the last year. So, uh, to give you an example, uh, uh, Croatia is a, and, and Macedonia are already candidate countries since uh, four years, and they are still waiting in front of the door. Because uh, uh, after the big enlargement, there was some sort of backlash telling, look, the digestive capacity of the Union is over. And uh, I do think that uh, to restart it, uh, you need time, and you have to start from the less controversial problems that are Croatia, Macedonia, and then Serbia and the others, forming the Bavarian countries. Uh, uh, Ukraine uh, clearly with the problem of the relation with Russia that we rise today, with the split of Ukraine, of course, with the deep split inside Ukraine, you rise a political problem that in this moment is impossible to rise. Uh, inside the Union, uh, the problem has been uh, brought on the table by, by the Polish. They are always the advocate of Ukraine and uh, is absolutely understandable, uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that it is feasible that it will take progress in the next uh, uh, time. This is the reason also why, as I told in the previous seminar, I proposed the so-called Ring of Friends, let's say, for the countries around Europe, from Belarus to Ukraine, uh, also not not strictly on the border, Moldova, uh, Georgia, uh, and then from Morocco to Egypt, uh, Israel, and so on, they could uh, deal with the European Union uh, agreements, bilateral, sharing with the Union everything but institutions. It, so, very strong alliance and very, let's say, to have a in Europe very much open but without being members of the European Union because the problem of the border so difficult to solve with Ukraine and with uh, Turkey because I, we didn't talk about that we, we have analyzed yesterday the problem of Turkey uh, it's uh, uh, this type of problem ca uh, can be in some way alleviated uh, with this sort of uh, semi uh, membership or uh, let's say half uh, membership let us call it uh, and uh, this would be also very important for 
diluting the concept of nations, you know, uh, the rigid concept of sovereignty that can be in some way, in some way, watered down uh, with this uh, strong uh, relation with neighbor countries. I do not want to disagree. Uh, I'm, I think Romano is right uh, in both the uh, pronouncements to say the next decade is the decade of the enlargement of the European Union to the Western Balkans. Uh, this will be an enormous task, um, which, by the way, is uh, very much coinciding with uh, the with the heritage of the European Union, because the European Union was founded in order to create peace and stability, and the first stage was to get peace between France and Germany, so to heal the wounds of the Second World War. Then the next step was to support Greece, Portugal and Spain in their transition uh, to democracies. The third step was now to heal the wounds that were produced by the Cold War in Europe, so the split uh, uh, by the Iron Curtain. And now the fourth stage will be uh, to bring peace and stability to the region that was uh, fundamentally destabilized uh, by the war in the former Yugoslavia. So this is of crucial importance uh, for the future of the European Union and we are going to focus on that. Uh, then of course the ardent questions of uh, the Turkish membership uh, will uh, be in front, in front of us and uh, has to be answered. We uh, talked about that uh, in length uh, yesterday. And I think it's true that uh, one cannot say that for all the other neighbors there is only the zero or all option to say you become member or you are not member. And uh, I think with the realistic perspective that not everybody can become member immediately, it's fair to have this uh, ring of friends where an ever-increasing cooperation uh, can be uh, can be realized. And by the way, I think that uh, uh, the question of the Ukraine is, of course, uh, one of the most important questions, also for the European-Russian uh, relationship. And I think that uh, an improved European-Russian relationship would help a lot for the future uh, stabilization, also of the Ukraine. Yeah, for example. When there was a discussion to enlarge NATO to Georgia and Ukraine, and the most part of European countries, they voted no because it was provoking the attention that you can't have, you know, this this enlargement of NATO if this brings damage to all the allies. In the future, could be could be made, you know, could be possible, but now it's not possible. I would betray my Porsche and Ukrainian friends if I didn't say that one of the most significant things for Ukraine right now, having just been there last week, is the prospect, the ultimate prospect of joining the European Union, motivating all sorts of political, social, cultural changes. And so the realism and the pragmatism is heard, but at the same time the promise has already shaped so much change. I suspect that's one reason why my Polish colleagues would be such advocates of that. No, the Polish colleagues also have to be advocates of that because they lo owe a lot to the Ukraine out of the history of the 20th century. Absolutely. Frankly speaking, I don't think that uh, 
we are mainly dealing with regional concerns. I mean, this is the basic suggestion behind the principle of unanimity. But when the European Union nowadays is trying to to tackle climate change or uh, the question of the economic and the financial crisis and the question of uh, education <coughs> and uh, science and uh, research, uh, there might be different uh, uh, consequences in some parts, but they are cross-continental issues. They're cross-continental issues. And I think we have reached with all the economic differences we still have, even within the Eurozone, and we uh, talked about some of them yesterday, but we have reached a level of integration where uh, I would say the differences within Europe are sometimes not larger than the differences within one single member state. And therefore, I, I, I don't think that the question of the, let's say, regional concern should be the driving force, but accepting <coughs> the level of integration we have, talking about the cross-continental issues that we ha have well, ahead he, of us. He directly, he has hinted to a problem of the difference, you know. When you have, let's say, let's say the press room in Brussels, the question of the media people are different country by country, you know, from this point of view, he is, he is right, you, know, you have not still <coughs> some sort of melting pot in the mm. interest, you know, and the problem uh, that we didn't touch on these two days is the media. You have only one European media, Euronews, uh, nothing else, you know, there was an effort to build a, a weekly it was well done, European. It, it went in bankruptcy. Because, you know, and, and this is an enormous political problem because, you know, not having a European opinion, public opinion, European press, and European television, the politicians, when there is a, let's say, some sort of fighting or, or different interest between the country and the Commission, they are in some way pushing, always push it always to take part in favor of the country uh, strictly because the public opinion is certainly pushing in this direction you know I, I also had this experience before going uh, before going uh, uh, being president of the European Commission when I was prime minister in the first time quite a few times you know when you didn't know how to get out of, of, of some problem you say it's Brussels <laughs> <laughs> and it was Everybody was saying, you know. And then I learned it was things when I did the other job, you know, in the second time. I never did it. But I tell you, the experience of a politician is to be pushing. Because the media are, 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 are. And then you touch the problem of language. That is, uh, you know, the, the European challenge is so big also. Because, uh, you know, intellectuals now, they speak uh, almost all the English.
challenge is great. Even I repeat, I repeat the English is really dominating. When I had five, five years, a little more than five years in the Commission, uh, in the beginning, 15 countries, and then uh, 25. In the beginning, we have three working languages, Italian, Fra uh, French, uh, German, and English. In the beginning of my commission, 60% was speaking in 2020, and then 18 and 10, 10, you know. And, you know, in any informal meeting, in which, of course, you have to use the language that everybody knows, then the English becomes dominant, you know. So it's, uh, even if you can never tell it to the French, <laughs> but, but step by step we are growing to have a, some sort of European Latin you know and so uh, but we need 50 years again you know and then well it, it's like the Roman Empire in which uh, different people uh, they spoke different language but you had the Latin that in some way was was the language of people who, who, who ruled the country so we are arriving to this point but we need some decades not less. Concerning this uh, media issue, I mean, I think we will not be able to uh, afford for all the European leaders uh, the same um, uh, size of uh, educational program than for Romano, who had the privilege not only to be a prime minister but also to be the president of the commission and therefore uh, got to understand you, both. You will still have time. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but the thing is, if you do one exercise, take the most important newspapers of all the 27 member countries prior to the European Council and then study which issues are described, analyzed, etc. there. I think it would be, if you would not know it, it would be very difficult to guess that these 27 are all going to the same meeting. <laughs> and if you, after the European Council, are doing the same exercise and reading about the results of the European Council in the newspapers of the 27 uh, member states, you will question yourself, how could they have been in the same meeting? <laughs> because it's not only the question that... Uh, so-called pretended national interest uh, against uh, Brussels. Sometimes <coughs> there are issues produced in the forefront of the European Council that are not on the agenda there. Because the best thing for a Prime Minister is the following. You are creating an issue in Austria, we are creating the issue that um, the European Commission wants to uh, take away our water resources. So that they are not only under Austrian control, but that this would be uh, under European control. And uh, now we have to give part of our water to Andalusia and <laughs> to other places. So, so you, create, you create a subject. So everybody then, after two weeks of national debate, understands the enormous menace that uh, in the next council meeting, they will be taking the decision about the Austrian water. The Austrian prime minister will say, well, I'm going to fight like a lion in Brussels because the Austrian water will stay Austrian. <laughs> and he goes to the European Council. Nobody talks. Nobody talks about the Austrian water. It's not a big It's not a point of conflict. But as a result of the European Council, he will address his national audience. And victory was ours. <laughs> Austrian water still is Austrian water. <laughs> and the picture behind it is, of course, still this figure of we and Brussels and to defend national inter interests against the European and national media and national media and this of course creates uh, uh, the type of uh, lack of consciousness that we are that we are experiencing in Europe the second thing concerning the languages it's true that we are 
more and more developing a universal European language without any, which is bad English. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be in favor that everybody in the European Union is allowed to speak English with the acceptance of the British and the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Because the formula should be, and I think this would be the result, that you have to speak in another language than your mother tongue. So it's up to you. you the British use French or German or whatsoever or Italian, uh, and the others also use, I do not know, maybe English, German, whatsoever. At the end of the day, I can tell you what would be the result. The result would be that with the acceptance of the English, of the British and the Irish, everybody would speak English, and they speak, I do not know what, French or Italian or whatever they like. Uh, uh, but then it would be level playing field. No? It would be level playing field. Nobody would talk in his or her mother tongue, but in another language. And I think this would be much easier for our joint purpose uh, uh, in Europe, and by the way, quite educative for the British. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it would be a good way to silence the British. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think that would work for one simple reason. The uh, alternative to English for most English speakers in the United Kingdom is to shout very loudly at the foreign person in English. <laughs> And that counts, I think, as an alternative idiom. Not, he's not joking. Language is, in the European Union, an instrument of power. Of course. That is a serious proposition. It is an instrument of power. And the English-speaking commission, and they use in the commission, you know, they have an advantage even the language well and it's an advantage. So I'm not going to... Can I have a question up here? Yeah. Um, I had the chance to attend uh, discussions with both of you last year, so now I'd like to make a, a, a comparison. What I uh, observed w is basically there is not so substantial, not so radical, but some sort of a change in your uh, tone of voices and also your in your attitude. Last year, as being you know, major supporters of the EU project, you were uh, very confident and like, supporting uh, everything regarding, for example, enlargement or other issues. And let's like you never suggested something like uh, you know privileged membership or uh, basically an alternative project that will enable the initial project to be more successful. These kind of things. Does that only have to do with the uh, recent crises that the EU is f uh, facing now, or maybe something to do with the uh, recent elections, which we may summarize it by just saying uh, the glory of the conservative voices within the EU? No, in the first, uh, no, the recent elections, they, they went as well for casting or uh, for the. Uh, simply uh, that uh, uh, we are more realistic, you know, more empiric, and uh, we, we have chosen to, to tell, to speak not only in theory, but to tell you the real day-by-day -day obstacles that we have in front of us. You know. I think that we have simply done a more <coughs> honest uh, analysis, you know, sometimes when you make general observation, you skip the obstacles that you have making step by step. And I wanted, you know, to illustrate this uh, honestly because otherwise if you don't do that, you do expect uh, some sort of change in the short time or in the medium time. And this is clear that uh, after the difficulties of the approval of the Lisbon Treaty You know, there is this feeling in quite a few member states. Uh, they are also declare it for 20 years or 10 years. There is, don't come to speak about any change in the treaties or a big uh, change in the power of the union. We have done that. Like, you know, when you have delivered the baby, it was so painful. Uh, and so it's 
look now objectively, you know. And this is the psychological atmosphere that you find now inside the European Union. Well, it's interested by uh, Ken Point Kusenbauer's uh, discussion about direct taxation as opposed to going through national units, which brings up a much more general question of the European Union as a collection of nations versus the collection of people. Uh, and also putting that together with your other comment about how the elections, European elections at the uh, local level don't seem to make any difference to the European, the executive of the European Union. Uh, but to presuppose or to imagine a way in which the local election, the election at the local level of European parliamentarians could affect the election of the executive presupposes a structure of parties existing in the European Parliament, which as far as I know does not now exist and the relationship between the individual elector and those parties as opposed to the parties at the national level, which is in fact the way the vote takes place in the European Union. Um, so I wonder, do you see major problems with the identity and nature of political parties in the European uh, Parliament? And is there any prospect of change there? Well, I'm very much in favor of um, European parties. Uh, and I think the party of European uh, Social Democrats that I know better than uh, some of the other parties uh, made some progress uh, in the last four to five years. Uh, we are far away from being a party like the one on the national level, <coughs> but I think we have made progress. And if you are looking into the history, into the history uh, of uh, democracy <coughs> and the right to vote, one would observe that uh, whenever the right to vote was enlarged to a bigger crowd of people, because at the beginning we were also talking about democracy, but only a very limited number within each population had the right to vote, that the structure of the parties was adapting to the new rules. So the, uh, let's say, the history of uh, the so-called mass parties is a history that is clearly connected, that is clearly connected uh, with the development uh, of uh, the universal suffrage. For instance, in Austria, in 1907, when uh, men got the rights to vote, because uh, women then followed only in uh, uh, 1991, when men got the right to vote, at that moment you did not have, uh, let's say, mass parties uh, of the kind and of the type uh, that we are accustomed to nowadays. The development of those parties was a consequence of the development of the right to vote. And therefore, I think that uh, it's very useful that we are trying to build up European parties now. But only <coughs> if we give the existence of European parties an additional leverage that is going beyond the existence of a combination of different national parties, only then uh, that would come through. And I think, by the way, one first step in this direction is not the provision of the Lisbon Treaty, that at least the President of the Commission will be nominated by the strongest party in the European Parliament, which means that each of the political parties on the European level, at least have to agree on one, that they are going to present and maybe also portray uh, during European elections, because this would be the idea behind, you know, that uh, when you are going to elect somebody, uh, that he should also play, or she, play a major role <coughs> during an electoral campaign. So I think this is one step also in the direction of strengthening uh, the existence of European parties. Um, so basically along those lines, 
How do you foresee the individual governments uh, themselves reacting to, or consenting with, rather, the consignment of power required from redirecting taxes away from them and uh, to the yeah. European Union and strengthening the political appeal of the whole? Well, in this moment, it's mainly negative. No doubt. bargain of uh, power that is existing now is accepted and to make step in the direction of direct taxation in this moment is uh, absolutely impossible to get because is embodied the idea that uh, will be additional taxation this is clear this is my, we don't trust that this would be neutral. So uh, I think that uh, you have to do step by step, demonstrating that uh, some uh, taxation that is special is done for advantage of all the countries. You have to do it, uh, I think, in, in, in many states. Otherwise, the moment is against. I agree that at the moment it is against and that the best method to get them is uh, trying to build a consensus uh, on new taxes and when you reach a general acceptance of that then to say but we are not going to collect them on the national level but this should be a European task. <coughs> Two examples for this I think are is a financial transaction tax where a certain consensus is building up uh, mm -hmm. also among governments in Europe. And environmental tax. And the second is environmental taxes and they're mainly a kerosene tax for instance uh, is one that at least up to now is reaching the broadest consensus. And they are out of the tradition of additional tax. Yes. This is otherwise we would never You've explained many times, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting to understand that, that the driver of the European Union project was political, mainly to pacify uh, the region, etc. And you've also mentioned uh, Turkey as being probably the limit of that idea, because you won't, we don't need to pacify Turkey or to do anything of that sort. So my question is, do you see inside Europe an economical project re replacing the or could that be the future of Europe in creating an economical power inside the world that could help uh, drive that and bring new uh, motivation for that project? Well, these things you, you don't see on paper, you know. You correctly, you correctly told that, uh, you know, it was a political project. Uh, I'll give you an example. Of, of, of a jump ahead of an economic decision that uh, uh, nobody should have never dreamed, the Euro. The Euro, it was in the mind of coal the price to pay for the German unification. It clearly told me so many times, you know, let's say, the German unification, the British were uneasy, the French were uneasy. I wanted to demonstrate that Germany is not the old Germany but it's a new Germany in favor of Europe, and so the Euro. The Euro was needed, sacrifice, the Deutsche sacrifice. Start from the treasury of Germany that everybody felt that was the most important, uh, uh, let's say, face of Germany, the Deutsche Mark, and say, look, I am disposed to this because this is a goal. And he fight against everybody in Germany. And he got the approval when, after years and years, he demonstrated it was a general interest. So, I think that we need some of this incident of, of, of history that to make this progress. To say on paper, we shall go progress on this one, on this one, uh, my answer, of course. I think that uh, when you have a common currency, you need a common economic policy. It's clear, you know, it's rational. When will be, maybe there will be some incident in some country or some deviation 
from a common policy in the sense that you need to intervene with a big amount of money and everybody agrees in this moment and then you create uh, the new economic policy instrument. So I think that you have to exploit history and have leadership eh, if you have uh, skeptical leaders on uh, European uh, Union. It's, uh, accusing 
me and us, you know, let's say, you create the euro for bankers, the money, the currency. Uh, this is only uh, uh, economic and uh, not political. But then, you know, look, the currency is the foundation of the state. So to put together the currency is the highest political decision that you can take, you know. So if you put economic policy together, is a political decision. To have some sort of European taxation is a political message, is not an economic message. So, but, you know, the anti-European, they are always very dedicated to say, uh, Europe of the bankers, greedy Europe, all economic Europe, you know. And then, uh, they deny that these are really the most important political decisions that you can take in any country. This is not the, what is happening here. One last question for the evening. Right. Um, you talked about the, you know, the problem of politicization, that we need, that we need more politicization. I believe that the, the road to politicization passes through the road of more information. And, you know, you mentioned this as well, but I think these are, these are interconnected. I think there is a huge information deficit about what the, the union is about. I think that uh, average people think about the Brussels as a very abstract thing. And uh, uh, you, you mentioned about this issue that uh, th there was the impossibility to create a newspaper. I wanted to ask you what kind of platforms could be created in order to sort of popularize the, the issues, uh, to, to delegate them, so that people get to know what is going on in the commission, what is going on in the parliament. I, I repeat it, you need time, you know, <laughs> always, <laughs> in order to be always very practical and, and empirical, you know, when I was president of the commission in Brussels, all the big Italian newspapers, they had correspondence, they had withdrawn most part of them, because there is no interest not to, to attack Barroso, why they attack Barroso, they don't say, attack to, 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 to attack Prodi was very popular <laughs> in the country. <laughs> <laughs> so this well, game there was something to attack no? <laughs> from a certain <laughs> political perspective. No, so, so <laughs> no I, I give you the example because when we told very honestly that you need a progress in the language, you need a progress in the institutions, you need media to answer to your question, you, know, you cannot create artificial because you play the European, the, uh, the, uh, the weekly, that was well done, and then they closed it up because, you know, there were no readers, because it was uh, 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 not uh, reproducing the daily fighting of the national political life. And this is why, uh, 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 you know, Alfred has been perfectly correct in Italy, you have to politicize Europe. If you are not a fighter, for in the future for a president of the commission between uh, Mr. A socialist from France and B uh, Christian democratic from Germany or, or other things you will never receive uh, the bloody attention of people you know. so this is politics politics is blood you know. uh, and, and you have to create this step by step so you will need a big issue to make a big battle and then you will have the complete change of that. Uh, the progress is done is that now you have meeting of European political parties, you have already the first step in that, but it's not sufficient to, to, to answer to your question. And, uh, for I'm talking also about very basic documents. I mean, you were talking about the Lisbon Treaty. What percentage of the people who voted for this has really read the document. I think this is this is a major question. Yeah, but why should they? <coughs> why should, why should they? It's so I mean, mo most of the most of the people that go to elections in Austria also never have read the Austrian Constitution. <laughs> why should they? No? Uh, the, the, the most the most important elements they know, and I think the most important thing about Lisbon is not uh, to read the treaty, but to explain to people what makes the difference between 
before and now, and this can be summarized in uh, five sentences. It's very simple. You know? And uh, I think, by the way, that uh, in addition to what Romano said, it's true that the political interest for, let's say, European questions still is uh, embryonic, but uh, it starts to become better. And this is very, uh, very easily to be compared with the United States. I mean, in the United States, you have different interest groups that are not following all the issues that are in Congress or in Senate, but they are following the issues they are specifically interested in. And with the type of legislation we have now in Europe, which very often is not a legislation that concerns uh, national versus European level, but how you're regulating the one or the other issue, you detect that more and more interest groups, and it's not only industry, but consumers and others that are interested in the issue, they are informing people, and they have their websites, and there is a, a debate, and they are doing demonstrations in Strasbourg and in Brussels. So, but it's and true. And the lobby that you have in Brussels is increasing. Like of, in course. of course. Of course. You know, this is so this is the beginning of a process which, uh, which I think is, uh, uh, is quite positive. And in addition, you need two things. One is political battles, yes. And the second is political symbols. And in political symbols, we are already quite well advanced because the best one is the European Champions League in football, which is <laughs> one of the most attractive exercises you can find around the world. <laughs> Unless yeah. Scottish teams are playing, we drag it down every time. We <laughs> 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 shouldn't be allowed in. No, but in, in terms of symbols, you know, yeah. the progress, you know, we couldn't put in the Treaty of Lisbon the anthem and the flag. And the flag. Yeah. How? Because you know, when I say the, uh, it's this political problem, you know, uh, Tony Blair didn't want to have neither the flag nor the anthem. Because then it's a nation preserve. You know, these are only nations, you know. And this seems negligible problem, but these are important problems, you know. Uh, well, the flag is, is already there, and the anthem. I was in my portable telephone, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's, going, it's going on, you know. So if but Tony Blair likes it or not, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, but when you think to that, there was a battle, and now if you read <laughs> the Lisbon Treaty, there is no hint to the flag or, or, or to the anthem, you know, because why? Because they are simple of nature. And if you don't want to, May I? But doesn't the European Cup? Uh, that does not uh, is not the European uh, European symbol. Actually, it doesn't. It, it works against it. If you have a, a championship with Europe versus Asia and Brazil, you will have an, a European team. That mm -hmm. would be a symbol to create <coughs> national <coughs> unity. Because what you have there is fights of nations against nations. Instead of war, you have this is what you no, have. No, it's not a fight of nations. It's a fight of clubs. And also in the national championship. No, no, the European Cup. Yeah. The European Cup. I mean. Yes, the, and in the European Cup you have. Uh, uh, no, no, when, when you, you, when you are then no, on no, the no, European Cup, you have nations. You know. Then you have nations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is the diversity that we are going to exercise. In Austria, it's also Salzburg playing against Vienna, and we are all together. <laughs> no problem. But when America plays against Europe in golf, that's when the unity. <laughs> the thing is that they never play America against Europe, but normally America against the rest of the world. <laughs> In the President's Cup. You know. I can't imagine a better point on which to end this evening. But, 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 but before we end, I think we have to say a couple things. This ends the conversation this evening and ends this workshop conference that we had over the last couple of days. But it doesn't end the commitment to understanding what the European Union means, not only for Europeans, but for the rest of the world. Because where else, I think, can we learn more about the challenge of managing different kinds of flows from the financial crisis to the environmental crisis and the thinking about the policies that need to be developed? Where else can we think about the reconstitution of publics 
and the ways in which information can play a role, and the ways in which media can play a role, the ways in which language plays a role. And where else can we think about the ways in which those other Ps, besides policies and publics, but professors and prominenti, and whatever P we can use to talk about this public and the students and at Brown University, to think about the ways in which the conversations we have today carry forward in the research and the teaching and the scholarly engagement with public that we have in the future. So with that, I just want to say thank you for this evening. Thank you to Mark Blythe for conceiving this whole affair, but especially to our guests, Professors Prodi, Professor Gusenbauer, thank you. Thank you.